Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Inter-American Dialogue. It's a pleasure to, uh, to see all of you this morning, and thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, we're delighted to have with us this morning uh, Luis Gilberto Murillo, Colombia's Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, and a very good friend, uh, both personally and of the dialogue uh, for many, many years. I also want to thank his uh, excellent team for Danielle and others for making this possible and for their uh, coordination of this event. Uh, Minister Murillo was appointed by President Santos to this very important cabinet position uh, just over a year ago uh, in the context of Colombia moving towards a peace agreement between the government and the FARC. Uh, reaching that agreement, as all of you know, uh, has not been easy, has been very complicated. But even more difficult, perhaps, is undertaking a successful implementation in key areas. The accord promises to reduce the negative consequences of guerrilla activity, such as uh, oil spills and the like. And at the same time, it proposes an agenda to manage and limit deforestation in former conflict zones, um, as large parts of the country are now, will be open for economic development. Uh, the country also has climate change goals related to the post-conflict and commitments uh, with the Paris uh, Climate Accord. Uh, Minister Murillo is superbly equipped to tackle these challenges, not only because he frequently attended dialogue events uh, when he lived here in Washington. Um, he is a mining engineer by training, and he served as governor of Chocó, uh, two times. Uh, Chocó is a department that is predominantly Afro-Colombian, which is the population that has been hardest hit and most affected uh, by the armed conf conflict over the years. Uh, Afro-Colombians and Afro-Latinos have no stronger <coughs> champion and advocate than Minister Murillo. He has done this not only uh, in Colombia uh, and throughout the country, but when he was here in Washington for about a decade and served as the Phelps Stokes Fund Senior Fellow and Vice President for Programs and Strategy. The dialogue has been very fortunate uh, to work closely with Minister Murillo, not only when he was here, uh, but since his time as minister. Uh, he participated in an event uh, that we had on clean energy and also was uh, consulted and involved in a project on the post-conflict uh, environmental challenges, uh, which resulted in a report uh, called Peace and Environmental Protection in Colombia, Proposals uh, for Sustainable Rural Development. And uh, I wanna recognize my colleague, Lisa Vecides here, who is the director of our program um, in, uh, in energy, climate change, and extractive industries for her uh, superb work in this area. And she was the one who coordinated, organized both the meeting in Bogota on clean energy, as well as the very successful project on the uh, environment challenges in post-conflict. So I wanna thank you. There are copies of the report uh, available outside. There are only about 8,000 left, so you might want to <laughs> rush after the session and just uh, pick up one. Um, but in any event, um, so thank you all for coming. Um, before we hear from Minister Murillo and before we hear from you, your comments and questions and have a good uh, exchange, uh, that we have a uh, short video to present. And after the video, uh, Minister Murillo will will make his opening remarks. So thanks again for coming. Appreciate it. La paz está en nuestra naturaleza. La naturaleza ha estado sometida a diversas presiones, como la extracción indiscriminada de nuestros recursos naturales, dejando a su paso degradación de nuestros ecosistemas. 
Desde el gobierno se planteó a través del Plan Nacional de Desarrollo la Estrategia Nacional de Crecimiento Verde, fortalecida con los compromisos adquiridos tanto en el Acuerdo de París en 2015 como en el ingreso al Comité de Política Ambiental de la Organización para la Cooperación y el Desarrollo Económico y el cumplimiento de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible con el fin de preparar el terreno para la implementación del Acuerdo de Paz. Para dar cumplimiento a estos compromisos, el sector ambiente se ha venido modernizando a través de la creación del Fondo de Adaptación de la Autoridad Nacional de Licencias Ambientales y a través del impulso y adopción de políticas como la Política Nacional de Gestión de Riesgo de Desastres, entre otras. Alcanzar los objetivos que se había planteado el Ministerio es una ardua tarea y por eso establecimos cinco líneas estratégicas de acción. Adaptación al cambio climático, conservación de fuentes hídricas y delimitación de páramos, declaración de áreas protegidas, producción y consumo sostenible, recuperación y restauración de áreas degradadas. Estas líneas permiten que el sector ambiente se articule para el cumplimiento de las metas ambientales del país y además para el alistamiento de los territorios para el posconflicto. En el marco de implementación del Acuerdo de Paz, necesitamos controlar temas como la extensión de la frontera agrícola, los cultivos ilícitos, la extracción ilícita de minerales y madera, así como el control de la deforestación. Hemos logrado desde el Ministerio de Ambiente la delimitación de 21 páramos, sumando un millón de hectáreas protegidas en el territorio y el abastecimiento de agua a más de 27 millones de personas. El país cuenta con 23.9 millones de hectáreas de áreas protegidas. La meta es completar 25.9 millones al 2018. Adicionalmente, Colombia logró disminuir en un 56% la deforestación y ha restaurado más de 150.000 hectáreas. A preservar nuestros ecosistemas e impulsar un nuevo modelo de desarrollo sostenible, nos ayudan programas como Visión Amazonía, Bancos de Hábitat, Bosques de Paz y Banco 2. Como balance de estos nueve programas se han logrado consolidar 93 alianzas con una inversión que asciende a los 19 mil millones de pesos, de los cuales el sector ambiente lleva invertido 3 mil millones de pesos. Ministro Murillo. Thank you very much, Michael, uh, for this uh, opportunity uh, to be uh, here at the dialogue. I'm a very good friend and associate of the dialogue for uh, uh, many years, and uh, also uh, at this uh, uh, point in time, we are working on several projects, as you mentioned, with Lisa, uh, that is uh, leading the, the program on, on uh, environment and climate change and several reports. And the last one uh, was uh, obviously related with the uh, environmental protection in the, in the era of peace process and peace uh, agreement implementation, which is very relevant for the country. I see uh, many uh, uh, friends here, familiar faces, like Cristina, um, uh, uh, also, um, Walter, who is here, and, um, and many friends that uh, that uh, we had the opportunity to work when we were in uh, in uh, when I was in Washington. Uh, today, really, we wanted to uh, to share with you some of the of the uh, um, aspect of the environmental policy that we are <laughs> implementing in in Colombia. And I want to put this in, in context. Um, the reality of the country is that Colombia is a, a you know, very rich, a very uh, diverse country in terms of environment. Also, it's very diverse in terms of its people. And uh, the country is really making progress in, in the include more population that traditionally have been excluded, including then in the mainstream Colombia. However, we have many challenges um, that are related to their conflict, and that's why it's so
critical for us the, the success in the implementation of the peace agreement that was reached with FARC. One of those challenges are related with uh, many illegal activities associated with the exploitation of natural resources. First, uh, uh, the uh, illegal mining is one of the challenges that we face in Colombia. Due to the conflict, we uh, have a degradation of almost 1.5 million hectares of very important land and ecosystem in the country due to the conflict and the illegal mining associated with it. Also, the uh, illegal uh, extraction of timber and uh, woods in the country, oil spills. The recent oil spill in Colombia was happened last week. The uh, uh, ELN attacked the uh, Caño Limón Coveñas pipeline, creating tremendous negative impact on all this area of the state of Santander. Also, uh, the uh, illicit crops like coca cultivation, which is one of the challenges that we have in the country. And this creates enormous pressure on our forest and our soil, water resources, landscapes, uh, generating into deforestation CO2 emissions, erosion, water pollution, extinction of very important species, and degradation of the ecosystem. To respond to these challenges that we have uh, in the country, we are using the framework of uh, already establishing the National Development Plan, which is the green growth. Also, um, advancing in the implementation of sustainable development goals, the Paris Agreement, on climate change, uh, the access to OCD, and also the implementation of, of peace agreement. And the strategy, the five strategies that you already heard about, uh, in the video. In implementing this strategy, we are bringing more dialogue with regions, with provinces, and also with civil society. Particularly regions and, and uh, of the country that traditionally uh, were uh, underrepresented or excluded. And the same, the same applied to the civil society organization. We also are um, basing our strategy in the need for modernization and uh, institutional capacity building of the entire environmental sector in the country. And in addition to that, the coordination with the private sector in order to reach our environmental goals. In terms of climate change, uh, that's definitely the most uh, important challenge that we face environmentally. We committed to decrease our, uh, our green uh, house gas emission in 20%. So we expect that by the year 2030, uh, uh, we have decreased that, em that emission of CO2 equivalent, equivalent in 20% uh, or 30% if we have the uh, important uh, support of the international community. And in terms of adaptation, one of our main strategies is to create or demarcate more protective areas in the country. And uh, I, I would like to mention that in that regard, President Santos, when, when came to the government in 2010, we have we has only 30 million hectares of protected areas, like national park, regional parks, um, areas of, of environmental interest for civil society. Now we have 23.9 million hectares in the country. And our goal is to reach 26 million hectares. And according to our projection, we will have 28 million hectares of protected areas in the country, creating this, what we call the Green Belt for Colombia. That's very important because it's a very courageous decision. If you compare this, in Costa Rica you have like six million hectares, the entire country. We are talking about 28 million hectares of protected areas in, in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, also, we are protecting 
areas, high high uh, land areas of paramos, wetlands. Uh, in terms of uh, decreasing deforestation, we we were able to decrease deforestation from 2010 to 2015 in five years, 50, 50, uh, uh, six percent, which is very significant. And also, it's very important to highlight that we, we were able to decrease deforestation when, at the same time, we have some increase in coca cultivation. We also have some areas that are our main focus for uh, 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 fighting deforestation in the country. We have eight zones in Colombia that are very important to, uh, for conservation. As you see, uh, the next one. Um, um, the next. The next. Uh, yeah, the next. This one, I wanted to show this. This, this picture is very important. As you see, this is the area where we are concentrating our effort to control deforestation, mainly in the south, to create this green belt to avoid the agricultural frontier to go into the Amazon of Colombia. We have the, the goal with. Uh, uh, the commitment with the international community, particularly with uh, Norway, uh, uh, UK, and Germany, to decrease deforestation in the Amazon to uh, zero, net zero defore deforestation in, in the year 2010, maybe in the year 2022. And also we have some areas of deforestation in the northern part of the country, including uh, Chocó, Antioquia, and others. Those areas, as you see, have some kind of coincidence, as you see, at the same areas where we have most of the coca cultivation in the country. So implementing the policy of controlling deforestation, including communities in protecting the forest, would also have direct impact on decreasing the coca cultivation in those areas. So that's why it's so important this intersection between the environmental policy and the uh, uh, drug policy in order to control um, deforestation in the, in the country. And uh, lastly, I wanted to show you, uh, and we can go further, um, the, uh, the areas that we are working in terms of implementing the, this process. The environmental sector have um, a lot of responsibility in implementing uh, the point uh, one, which is integrated rural development, and the point uh, forged in the, in the, in the uh, process, which is implementing the uh, uh, eradication policy for eradicating coca cultivation and firing uh, uh, drugs in Colombia. In that regard, we divided our responsibilities in three areas. One is policy and legislative development. We are implementing and we're designing and implementing laws that, are, uh, that have relation with, with uh, our sector. For example, we are uh, uh, working on a law that will allow uh, small campesino families to get land in areas that are part of the reserve uh, established in Colombia in, in the law second of 19, 1959. So we will have about 2 million hectares that could be titled to those small communities with the commitment to protect those areas. Also, we are implementing a policy that we will pay compensation, compensation to those communities for protecting the forest in, that, in those areas. This is one example. Also, we are working on the reincorporation of uh, members of the FARC. And uh, we have already planned, negotiated with FARC. So we, are, we are now have sector negotiation with FARC. And uh, in order to reincorporate almost 800 uh, former combatants of the FARC to work on environmental projects, including the protection of the forest in those areas that they know very well. Um, and lastly, we have some projects that we will implement in the areas that are where we have a significant uh, population of combatants, FARC, of the FARC uh, uh, rebels, and also uh, um, areas where they have um, a lot of influence. Uh, this is part of what I wanted to, uh, to share with you. This is our areas where we would like to include some members from, of the FARC to work with them. We already have the first project to be implemented in three um, uh, rural 
uh, zones for transition where former combatants of the FARC are. You know, this project uh, will be uh, funded by the uh, Kingdom of Norway. Uh, it's a project about three million dollars that we will work with, particularly 3,000 families in those areas of the south, but Caquetá and Meta, in order to uh, guarantee the incorporation of our um, uh, former combatants into environmental activities. But uh, the, the, the point that I would like to, to, uh, to highlight uh, today, first is that uh, under President Santos' leadership, we are implementing in the country a vision that is a vision of, of Colombia that it is, is, in, is in peace. And to do that, it's very important to implement very quickly what we agree with uh, FARC, and also to provide opportunities for those communities that were isolated from the rest of the country. And we are convinced that that opportunity can come through, the, through environmental protection and environmental projects. The second is that uh, the president is working on specific policies to implement the peace agreement, and also at the same time create, cre creating benefit, benefit from the environment. One of these policies is the payment, the compensation for communities that are located in areas that are very rich in terms of natural resources, in terms of, of the, the role they play in protecting the environment, and at the same time creating this uh, income for those, uh, for those communities and that will support the implementation on the ground of the peace, peace process. The second is that this, this is accompanied with funding. Uh, Colombia went into the path of uh, implementing what we call the green taxes. We, already, we, we are one of the countries that already have the carbon tax. I think that you here in the US don't have that tax, the carbon tax. Well, you are I think it's coming. behind. You are going behind. It's <laughs> it's coming, right? When hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> so we already implemented that. And those is earmarked to be to fund uh, projects in areas that uh, first for adaptation to climate change and also for mitigation of climate change. That's very important. And uh, at, and and at the end, we we are sure that environmental goal that we have in Colombia need to be. Uh, put in a new dimension, in a, in a new level of, of thinking about Colombia that is creating hope for many people. And uh, Michael knows that when we were here, we were working a lot to get more inclusion of Afro-Colombians, of indigenous communities. So they are, they are very hopeful that the peace process will allow them to be more included in the country. But that is happening now. It's, President Santos, and this is very important in the context of the U.S., President Santos has uh, um, um, appointed a lot of Afro-Colombians and indigenous uh, uh, professionals in his government. It's not, before it was one or two, we have now four vice ministers. We have uh, ambassadors that are representing the government, just to talk about, about the government of President Santos. But also, we have now about three members of the high courts that are Afro-Colombians. We have several deputy uh, 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 members of this court that also are ready to be on the spotlight. So Colombia is really making tremendous progress in this regard. And this is, this is part because of what we're doing in terms of the peace process. Now, we have challenges. And one of the challenges is how you are open up different places. You are uh, probably many want to go to those places and have development as usual. This is something that, that cannot be uh, allowed to happen. And this is the kind of challenges that we are confronting institutionally. The other challenge that I have put uh, in, in very high in our, in our agenda, and our policy agenda, is the uh, reform of the environmental sector. I proposed one reform that was not very welcome in Colombia. They said that was very, very radical. I'm from can be radical, but uh, radical change, but not, not radical in that regard. It was very radical in terms of, of, we need to put these institutions 
in a new hallway. And these institutions need to be able to control the areas where we have most of the environmental wealth of the country. And they need to be able to work with communities. They need to be able to allow uh, people that were in those areas, the former combatants of the FARC or others, to be part of these environmental sectors to protect those areas. So that's the kind of reform that we are, we are proposing as part of the, all this transformation that President Santos is uh, leading in Colombia. So Michael, this is was, was something that I wanted to share with all of you uh, um, in this disorganized way. But uh, as you told me, the most important is to have a, a quality conversation with, with you and all the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for that excellent uh, presentation and uh, very, very interesting uh, comments. And I think we can, we're going to open it up for, um, for questions and discussion. But let me, let me start, if I could, with um, the issue of expectations, which you touched on a little bit. But I mean, you're in a unique position in some ways, because as we were talking before the session, uh, you rarely leave the country, and you're rarely in Bogota. You travel throughout the country. You meet with lots of communities. And um, uh, it would just be useful to get, if you could share some of your perceptions and insights about what people are expecting from the peace process. Are you concerned at all that they may have uh, very high expectations that are going to be that are not going to be met because implementation is so complicated, so costly. There are always more problems than you, than you think there will be at the beginning. Uh, does that concern you? Just if you can give us just more of a feeling uh, about, or people just saying, you know, are they having expectations modest and saying, you know, I know there's a peace accord, uh, there are a lot of promises for changes, but change is going to take a long time. It's going to be slow. Uh, you know, just if you can just give us a some sense of that, since you really, you know, you're in a, you're in a unique position in some ways. Yeah, that, what, in my, what are you hearing? In my, in my uh, uh, visit to many communities and my dialogue with them, uh, my impression is that uh, first people are very hopeful ab about the peace process because they are the ones or were the ones suffering directly from, from the conflict. And, uh, this is the first priority that they have. The second is that the government definitely will have presence in, in those areas, not only with uh, security, with the security apparatus, but also uh, presence in general, giving them opportunities to make a decent living. And uh, obviously, they have uh, this. Uh, priority of seeing these projects to be implemented very rapidly. So something that we, we have discussed within the government is that at the same time you prepare all the legal strategy and the legislative of policy development to uh, implement the peace agreement you have to move into concrete projects, not only with former combatants of the FARC that need to be incorporated to society very quickly, but also with the community that surround them, for them to see that the change is real. Because if you don't May move quickly beyond Oh, I'm so glad they have been corrected. Whatever situ the situation is. <laughs> Got to be careful whatever you say here. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. Everybody. Everybody's okay. relieved here, so. 
Yeah, so, so we need to move quickly to the implementation. That's why, for example, in my case, we have this, every other week we have a conversation with the president about very specific projects in terms of the environment. First is the hope that people have. Uh, and it's like when you go, you go to the president with, to places that was impossible to go before. Uh, we demarcated some of the protected areas in El Cañón de las Hermosas, the Hermosas Canyon, where uh, Cano was uh, taken down. And we went to those communities. Uh, they were so grateful that they were able to live in peace, that we are doing that in conjunction with the FARC, and at the same time that the president was there telling them that we are implementing a specific project. And that, that is happening in many communities and the president is going directly to those places. And at the same time, we are moving into having a specific, uh, uh, like concrete examples of how the peace is helping these communities. For example, in Colombia, last year, in 2016, in those areas, and in many areas in the country that was impossible to go before, resources are, are going. And only in 2016, in Colombia, were discovered about 150 new species. So it's a huge benefit, dividend, of the peace. So communities are looking at this, but we need to move very quickly in terms of the implementation mm -hmm. specific projects. Great, thank you. Uh, I just have one more question, and then I'm going to uh, invite your comment. I see people on the edge of their seats. So uh, <laughs> if you just let me, uh, you're, uh, you're in Washington, and uh, uh, just speaking of expectations, what is uh, on the issue of expectations, what is the uh, Colombian government and your expectation in terms of uh, continued engagement, support, cooperation from Washington? Uh, you've been meeting with members of Congress. You've been here for a couple of days already. You're meeting with, after this event, you're going back to, back to Capitol Hill, be meeting with Congress. Tell us what your discussions are, what you hope to get out of your visit here, aside from having a wonderful event at the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, <laughs> for sure. For your, uh, just, uh, just what, what, what is your, you know, your expectation? What, how do you perceive the, the environment here in Washington expect to, to continue cooperation? Well, I think that, that uh, our expectation is that the U.S. government will continue the engagement with Colombia. That's critical, critically important. Uh, we are very grateful that uh, Congress approved the uh, package of, of uh, Plan Peace Colombia. Uh, it's very important for the country. And we we expect that the U.S. government will continue in the next couple of years with that or more level of uh, assistance to the country. Uh, and in, in that regard, we um, consider that that assistance uh, can move into new directions like uh, environmental issues and the role that environmental projects play in reaching the U.S. and Colombia policy goals of uh, fighting drug trafficking, particularly decreasing um, coca cultivation in those areas that we saw in my presentation. We obviously are concerned with some, uh, um, some people that uh, are coming to the U.S. and maybe uh, providing information that is not um, objective, uh, probably because they don't have complete information of what is happening on the ground, or probably for domestic political gains. So what we would like to make clear is that uh, most of the country 
the majority of the country support the implementation of the peace process, and the peace process is critical for reaching U.S. policy goals in Colombia that we share. And uh, also, we uh, would like to make, to make clear to uh, uh, the U.S. Congress and the policy community in uh, Washington, D.C., that uh, there are people in the country that very few, that they speak very loud, that are resisting the peace process because many people are not interested in, uh, in, uh, in the fact that the real truth about what happened in Colombia will be known. And uh, I'm telling you this being from Afro-Colombian community, small community, I'm from a small community, 2,000 people. A lot of presence of, of uh, armed actors, both uh, uh, rebels and, and paramilitaries and others. Many of us were forced to flee the country, and we were able to return now. So in between, there is a lot of things that Colombian society in general and the global society should know that happen in Colombia, and they are responsible for those. So I see a lot of fear. Uh, among some of the people that uh, don't want the, the truth to be known. Thank you. Why don't we start with the questions? If you could just please be brief, identify yourselves, wait for there's a microphone that's coming, and uh, we'll start with you. No, we'll start with this gentleman up front. Yeah. Can you tell us your name, please? it will have a tremendous impact on land restoration and conservation. Can you tell us a little sure. bit about the Banco Habitat? How are the plans to monetize biodiversity and habitat so that it can also be a driver for restoration, driver for conservation? Yeah, that, that's a good question because other people are saying that uh, President Santos is Castro Chavista. I, I hear that. Not here. So, not here. I don't. No. No. Not here. No. 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 no, no Michael. Okay. The dialogue never. Okay. But uh, but what, what I'm saying is, we are making tremendous effort to use uh, economic uh, tools to support environmental conservation. So uh, uh, I want to use only this example from environmental issues to see that President Santos is. Uh, one of, 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 of the most vocal uh, leaders in terms of how you can use market for environmental conservation. So that's not nothing about uh, Castro Chavismo that people are saying <laughs> in some place. So in that regard, we implement a huge package of taxes and incentive for environmental conservation. Uh, the carbon tax, also we are putting some taxes and and incentives for the use of uh, plastic uh, bags. Uh, and also, we are giving incentives for all environmental investment in Colombia. They don't pay the, they don't pay, uh, the value added taxes and other incentives. And in addition to that, we created, is this, is this, I think that is the first country in Latin America that created the Habitat Banks, which is private sector made an investment in uh, environmental conservation, particularly forests and others. And then the same market <laughs> pay for that investment. And also, it is funded by the taxes and payments and the royalties that companies need to pay when they affect, in one or another way, biodiversity. So this is, a, we start the, the first one in, uh, in Meta. And this Habitat Band includes also communities. So you can have local communities, uh, uh, private companies dedicated to environmental conservation. So we, are, we will create a very important piece of the market for environmental projects. Great. 
We have about 10 minutes, but let me, let's try to get as many questions as we can. Go here, and we'll go to Lisa. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Um, thank you, Minister. Um, thank you for being with us uh, today. Um, congratulations for the plans at Columbia. Tell us your uh, name, please. I'm sorry, um, Jaime Cavalier. Um, very, very impressive horizon. Uh, congratulations, especially for the creation of all those uh, new protected areas, especially in Paramos. I think they are critical. Uh, Colombia has most Paramos than any other country in the right. world. Um, in, in regard to the uh, coca fields, uh, recently in the press in Colombia, with uh, government data as well as in The Economist, it was reported that uh, back in 2012, 78,000 hectares of coca fields were present. In 2016, it went up to 188,000, um, and that's a sharp increase. Um, and I think that the peace process in Colombia is different from any other in the world because it's, you know kind of has this issue of illegal drugs and all the money that is actually coming through it. Um, and uh, with the sharp increase in the coca fields, you have a number of people that um, inherited the business, if you wish, and that make a pretty good living, uh, making the substitution of that uh, livelihood very, very hard. Um, so until we get rid of the coca fields altogether, um, I, I, I don't physically know how can the government replace or provide a, an alternative livelihood when there is so much money flowing through that channel. So the question is basically, what are the plans of the government to really reduce and eliminate the, the coca fields knowing that uh, have been actually uh, increasing? Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the, um, the increase in, in, in coca have several factors, and, uh, and some of them are in relation to expectation of some of, some of, of these criminal networks that were uh, in those communities. However, for the first time, we have a very solid plan for eradicating coca, which is sustainable. Because what happened, and we, we know that area fumigation and others was, was not sustainable. You eradicate coca, but then that coca from time to time was replanted. What we are doing now is that the peace process allowed to have a very concrete plan to uh, eradicate that coca forever. Why? Because in those areas, it was very difficult to get into because we were fighting uh, uh, the rebels. At the same time, you have landmines and all this kind of protection of this, of this coca cultivation. Today, you don't have that. To the contrary, you have park and uh, uh, helping to eradicate that coca. The government already signed with communities uh, agreements for eradication with concrete uh, indicators of results and with additional programs to develop in a, in a sustainable way those areas. Another approach that will be used is the approach of forced eradication in areas where there is not possibility to sign agreement. And in addition to that, we have the environmental dimension of it that was absent in previous plans. So many of the areas that are planted with coca that you saw in the, uh, in the agricultural frontier uh, uh, will be uh, restored with reforestation, and those communities will be working on uh, conservation and having environment, having uh, compensation and payments that, wasn't, that was not possible to do before. With those lines in our, the strategy, and also very focused on the areas that you saw, we have the goal to eradicate 100,000 hectares of coca this year. And we are going well. In the first three months, we eradicated more than 15,000 hectares of coca. And now, and, 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 and the trajectory is very positive. So we are very hopeful that in the next six months, you will see the change in that, in that, in that projection, that trajectory. Thank you. Lisa? Thank you. I wanted to ask a question about um, local community opposition to extractives projects, um, which is also a very environmentally um, focused topic. 
Um, there's mostly been opposition to mining projects, but there's also some opposition to oil projects, including um, and particularly fracking. So there is a case where um, a community actually vetoed a mining project. At the same time, the revenues from the sector are distributed throughout the whole country. Um, it's creating a lot of uncertainty for investment all over the country. So it, it is a national issue as well as a local issue. So given the sort of controversy and debate over this and that you know there are a lot of different perspectives that, that don't necessarily coincide, what do you think is a solution? Do you think there's a need for more dialogue? Do you think there's, you know, what, what would you see as a solution to this issue? Well, uh, the first thing that I, I, I say, my, my, I, I, I say my, my colleague from, from the Ministry of Mining and Energy is that his goal is to have more mines, and, but they need to do this very well. But my goal is to have the less I can and to have more protected areas. So <laughs> that's your problem. But no, no, that's, that's, that's the joke that I, it's because he's, he's very concerned and we are very concerned within the government. Uh, and we need to find the right uh, balance between the need that the country has for economic development, which is sustainable, and also the need for protecting our envirom environmental assets, and also protecting communities. And this is a tricky balance that we are, lo we are looking for. And, um, and Colombia is very rich, so what happened is the first, the uh, the, the ideology around uh, extractive industry in Colombia changed dramatically. So many, uh, uh, particularly from the left, uh, now that we are in peace, this is part of the post-conflict Colombia. Now that we are in peace, one of their uh, goals is to uh, 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 fight extractive industry, even good and bad. Uh, second, the politics of it also changed. The President Santos uh, took very courageous decision to share more uh, uh, in a more uh, uh, just way the uh, oil and mining royalties. For example, departments like Choco that don't have legal mining and oil extraction start getting a lot of resources for their development. But that was very, the, the political cost of, of that was very high. Uh, because now uh, many politicians in those regions are, are not very inclined to allow uh, oil and mining uh, uh, projects that are good, some of them are good, because they don't have this incentive. And also communities, uh, and that's the second. And the third is the dialogue. Uh, what I'm saying is that it's very important to have quality dialogue around proposals uh, at the local level between the national government, the local government, communities, and companies. Because also this is the Colombia in a post-conflict era. It's like before you could say very easily that that was influence of FARC or ELN or others. So you could, you could have the entire state apparatus like providing the spaces for this, for, for some of the companies. Now it's different. You have to talk to communities. You have to get into agreement with community how those projects will benefit them. And that's, and that's a legitimate uh, claim for communities. We need, we need more dialogue. This is on a specific projects, but also with the national dialogue. What is the development path of the country that is sustainable, that can have this uh, 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 framework of production and also sustainability? And what are the roles of different levels of government in terms of making or, or, or giving certainty, legal and otherwise, to companies but at the same time to communities. And this is a national dialogue that is just starting uh, now. Thank you. We, Daniel? Huh? Samuel, sorry, sorry, Don, sorry. Samuel, sorry. Uh, Minister, uh, get the microphone, please. Uh, my name is Sam Rocha. Samuel. Minister, welcome back to Washington. Uh, I have a quick question on a specific topic, which is Paramus. And I believe I agree with Mr. Cavalier that it's a very important topic 
not a little in bit, region, but in Colombia in general. Uh, specifically in the uh, resolution 1553 from September 2016, uh, in reference to Paramo, Chile, and Baragan, uh, Quindío, Tolima, Valle del Cauca. Um, I have two questions. One is you mentioned that about 800 ex FARC members are going to be reinserted from that region. In what capacity uh, are they going to be reinserted? And are those going to be reinserted in those particular Palmo areas? And the second one is <clears throat> how the owners of these lands are going to be benefiting from their lands who whose lands are being their only meaning of living for them uh, agricultural uh, uh, ganaderia <laughs> so what are they going to leave off because m some of these owners it took all their land not just three quarters of their land and I would like to hear what are they going to leave off what is the government going to do with them? Because the law mentions that you, as the government, are going to be doing something for them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of, uh, of, of the area of paramos that, that we demarcated, um, most of these areas will be protected bo by a special unit of the armed forces that we call Batallones de Montaña, which is also, uh, uh, Michael, one, one of the benefits of the peace process is that uh, significant part of the assets of the armed forces are now under our direction. So I already created with the Minister of Defense what we call seven, we, we call them uh, uh, seven units for for uh, uh, rapid reaction to deforestation in several parts of the country. So, Batallones de Montaña will are already working with us to uh, first to replant about one million fry lejones, which is the uh, the, uh, the plant that really are in the paramos. We were in Colombia with the support of the army and the. Um, the Universidad de los Andes to uh, 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 produce frailejones in in, in 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 close conditions. So that's your, so they will protect those areas. The incorporation of FARC uh, combatants will be in several uh, aspects. One, implementing concrete protection and conservation project in the forest that they know. And they will get compensation like anybody else that is will be doing this kind of activity under cert certification of environmental uh, actors. Uh, this the second one is that they can work directly for regional uh, environmental protection authorities as as uh, members of those organizations, and they will guarantee that they that uh, there is no deforestation. Why? Because uh, before in some areas, they were regulating illegally how you use natural resources. They have some kind of authority there, and people no, knew them. Some of them would like to maintain certain kind of authority that we can provide to the environmental sector without having weapons. And the third is assisting many of the uh, researchers that are going into those regions in their uh, investigation, in their work that they are doing in those areas. Those are just to mention three of them. And what you mentioned with families that are in areas of Paramos, we need to provide some kind of compensation if they disagree to have uh, um, environmental agreement with us to maintain those areas according to their zoning, uh, zonification that we are going to have in terms of the paramos. Because those areas, when you have paramos like uh, higher than 3,000 meters uh, 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 
from the sea, uh, sea level, legally they cannot be there. So this is a painful decision, but it's something that we're going to do and we are going to implement. But we'll provide so other alternatives. Thank you. I don't, I don't want to uh, abuse the uh, minister's uh, time. He's got important meetings uh, up on Capitol Hill and, and elsewhere in Washington. I just want to thank him on behalf of the dialogue and all of us here for, for coming and sharing his thoughts and insights. And we wish him all the best. We're, we're going to support you. And whatever we can do to be helpful, please let us know. And hopefully, you'll come back and give us sure, sure. a very, very positive, favorable update on how things are going with the implementation on environmental questions. Thank please you join much. me in thanking you, Minister. Thank you very much.